Hi everyone, friends, comrades, welcome or welcome back to another keynote speech of the Socialism 2021 conference. My name is Chloe and I'm from Socialist Alliance in Melbourne and I'll be the moderator of this session. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that I am speaking from the land of the Boon Wurrung and Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung people. These are the indigenous people of this part of the land here in Australia. I want to acknowledge and pay respects to their elders of this country, acknowledge that this land is stolen and recognize that it was never ceded. It was taken by force. And the struggle for First Nations sovereignty is deeply connected with the struggles against racism and border imperialism that we're dealing with now. Uh, we want to we pay respects um, to the real owners of the land and their right to struggle for justice. Before we begin, a few housekeeping rules. Um, please remember to respect each other's differences in views and opinions. Please post any questions you might have for the speaker in a short, clear and specific manner in the Q&A. That is the question and answer section which is separate to the chat box. Please also remember that the Q&A is not for having debates. It is for asking questions only. And lastly, we will not tolerate any derogatory remarks, sexist or vulgar postings, and the organizers will remove anyone if found to do so. So the topic we will be discussing is titled Rajava Revolution, Feminism, Self-Determination and Popular Power. And before we invite our keynote speaker, Saleh, uh, for those who are not familiar, the Rojava revolution is an incredible people's revolution. Um, with the eruption of the brutal Islamic State in Iraq and Syria in 2014, the Kurdish people, including many women, were on the front lines of the struggle against this misogynistic force, which they defeated. Now the Turkish state has escalated its war against the Kurdish people and the big Western powers are complicit in this. Many other people have joined the Rojava revolution from other regions. So they have people from different ethnicities and religions all fighting together for political self-determination, the liberation of women, for ecological stewardship and popular power. And what is incredible is that this is all happening under very difficult circumstances in the middle of a war zone under fierce repression where they face an economic blockade and a shameful betrayal by the major powers intervening in the region. The Rojava revolution continues to build a grassroots democratic system of popular power that is feminist and ecological, and that is an inspiration to anyone fighting for liberation from the racist, patriarchal and exploitative capitalist system, which is also threatening humanity with ecocide. Our keynote speech will be delivered by Saleh Moslem. Saleh is a member of the co-presidency council of the Democratic Union Party, the PYD in the autonomous administration of North and East Syria, Rojava. He has, in, he has been involved in the, or he is involved in the Kurdish liberation movement in Syria since the 1970s and is a prominent leader of the process which has become widely known as the Rojava revolution. After Saleh speaks, I will read out any questions you may have for him uh, that you can post in the Q&A. Uh, so now I would like to welcome and invite <coughs> Saleh to speak to us uh, about what we can learn uh, from the Rojava revolution and hopefully we can discuss what we can do in solidarity. So thank you, Saleh, over to you. Well, uh, good morning to everybody because we are in uh, very early morning at six and a half o'clock, yes. Well, um, first of all, I would like to thank all the comrades and friends who gave me this opportunity uh, to address all these people uh, over all the world and also in the uh, South East Asia. Thank you all comrades. And uh, first of all, also, I would like to introduce uh, Rojava. What is Rojava? 
if we say Rojava, it means uh, we have a piece of land uh, which is a part of uh, Kurdistan, a bigger Kurdistan, which was divided to four parts uh, uh, between the four uh, states, nation states. Uh, the Western one in uh, left in Syria, uh, under the control of Syrian government, it says uh, Rojava. And we are talking about three, uh, three million people, Kurdish people, which they are part of the Kurdish people living here. Uh, but uh, it doesn't mean that we are alone, of course. I mean, especially during the uh, Rojava revolution, we found all 50 million people Kurdish people uh, in the Middle East, they were beside us. And also friends like you, uh, they didn't leave us, left us alone. They were supporting this uh, revolution here. So uh, we are talking about the land and uh, people, which they are uh, the original people of this um, piece of land living in Syria. And this, uh, we and the Kurdi uh, Kurdish people, all the Kurdish people in four parts, we are surrounded by the very, uh, very strict uh, uh, enemies to the Kurdish people, which uh, they are Arabs, Persians, and Turks. So uh, actually, uh, our revolution was very, very difficult to, to do. The second point I would like to mention also uh, this revolution uh, depended on the organized people because we were able, I mean, as a party, PY part, PYD party, we were established in 2003. And since then, we were organizing these people till the revolution in Syria, the people of revolution, when they rise, uh, rose up, uh, there were Kurdish people also, we were looking for our demands. And between this fight, between all the sides, which they are Syrian regime and, the, and those uh, group, brutal groups which supported by Turkey, they were fighting. So we were able to make our revolutions in the 19th of uh, uh, July uh, 2012. And since then, we are struggling, uh, of course. But what I mean, we were able to organize ourselves before that organizing our people such as all the, uh, I mean, activities according to the people segments and so, and also um, for defense units, uh, we, were all, we were able to organize our YPG and YPG, which is uh, uh, women force. So they were protecting our area. And since then, uh, we were able to defeat, I mean, uh, well, to expel the Syrian regime forces from our land in 19th of July, 2012. And then uh, we found ourselves face to face with those brutal groups, which they were supported by Turkey. And so we had to um, also to fight against them. I mean, to keep uh, trying to keep our lands and our part of land safe from those uh, brutal groups which were, they were Jabhat al-Nusra and all those jihadist Salafis. They were groups just before Daesh to invade because Daesh was the similar one, but it was lately in 2014 when they came. Uh, when Daesh came also, we were able, because we were organized and we were able to fight and defeat them. And so, suddenly we found ourselves in fighting with the Turkey because when they tried to um, to get, get some gains through those groups, uh, they were not able. I mean, Turkey was not able to do that. Uh, their aim was to finish the Kurdish people because uh, their theory, I mean, in the Turkish fascism, uh, they say, if there is a Kurd, it means uh, our, our people, I mean, there will be no Turkish. So they are to, to, find, to finish the Kurdish people to make themselves, I mean, as they were doing along all the 20th century. So Turkey was, uh, because those groups, the tools uh, Turkey was using, they were defeated by our people, then uh, Turkey has to do it themselves. And uh, uh, it came in and now 
they're occupying many places of the Rojava, which is offering uh, Sedikani and also uh, Tel Abyad. And we are still struggling against these Turkish forces through the border, every day shelling, every day heating. And uh, there are, of course, I mean, uh, Daesh was finally defeated on the ground. I mean, in in uh, 2019, but still there is cells, uh, sleeping cells supported by Turkey and everywhere. We are facing them too. So this is the case now, uh, what, what happened. But uh, of course, I mean, uh, the point to, points which I want to stress on, the organized people, if they are organized uh, for some, uh, uh, I mean, uh, some targets and some uh, uh, ideological things, they, are, they were able to, they will be able to do everything. Uh, by organizing, I mean, we were depending on, on uh, looking for the uh, root, demo, uh, dem, demo, uh, root, root democracy, I mean, uh, for grass democracy for our people. And everybody was sharing uh, in this revolution and this protection and even uh, this fighting. Uh, I am not talking only on the Kurdish people, I'm talking about the you know, the other components we are living together. I mean, just like uh, the Arabs, which they are majority, and also with the Syriacs, which they were uh, killed, massacred by the Turkish people, and the you know, Syriacs left be behind. They are living in our places, and uh, we have we were able to establish a system which everybody is uh, sharing in it. For, for this culture, their uh, their culture and their language and their freedom to establish the political parties. We have about 25 uh, political parties in our, so they, we, if we say uh, grassroots democracy, it means uh, uh, everybody is sharing in it. And now we are trying, I mean, to um, discuss and find a solution for all Syria, because we have projects for all of Syria. We are trying to make Syria for, I mean, uh, decentralized Syria, every people to have freedom, which Syria was uh, despotic, as uh, everybody uh, knows uh, uh, what happened. I mean, in the past, only one party was uh, governing Syria since 1963, and that was the reason for the conflict which we are living now in Syria. So we are, uh, I mean, the first, uh, uh, we are the first example in the area, in the Middle East. This is one. And the point other for the women organization, uh, as you know, I mean, before Daesh to come in to north of Syria, they were, they had massacred the uh, Shangal which they slaved the, the people, slaved the, the women, and they were even selling the women in the, in the markets and so. So our women were very angry about that. And uh, uh, of course, as you know, I mean, um, when they invaded the Sanjar, Shingal, which uh, Shangal, they were uh, all, all of them. I mean, all the people living there, they were easy deeds which is a different religion, not Muslims. So those brutal Muslims, I mean Daesh, ISIS or say, so they attack them and they kill them. And also those Shangal people, they were Kurdish. So when they're directed to our places, uh, our women organization, they were very angry about that. And they, they, they were uh, trying to retaliate what happened in Shangal. So, the most fighting in Rojava, what in happened in 2014, it was by, led by the women organization, which is YPJ in our areas. And we were able, I mean, of course, and YPJ and YPG uh, to defeat Daesh in 2015. And then in Kobani, maybe the famous Kobani, everybody has heard about it. Uh, Kobani was the, the breaking point, I mean, for Daesh, and then uh, we were able to um, to go after them till it was mostly defeated in 
2019 and Alba was. It took about four years, uh, five years from us to defeat Daesh. Of course, the international coalition, which uh, contains about 73 countries, they were supporting our people. So we were able to defeat them, but it doesn't mean that they have uh, finished because uh, still they have sleeping cells everywhere. So, um, and now um, we have uh, a democratic self uh, administration in our area, which is called Northeast of Syria. Uh, and we have uh, a protection force, which called the uh, Democratic Syrian Forces, a uh, famous one, the most effective force against Daesh and those brutals, those Islamic jihadist uh, organization in our areas. And we are still doing our uh, duties uh, for the humanity and for our people and for, for all the uh, for our people and for our all the nations, I mean, because uh, uh, this Daesh was the most brutal organization of the world, I mean, it happened maybe in the history even. So we are protecting these values, protecting the humanitarian values against these brutals, and still we are continuing, continuing our fighting against them and their supporters, which is Turkish state turkish fascism states attacking us every day uh, every day because they were not able to defeat the uh, i mean they were not able to gain what they were hoping i mean from our areas to finish the kurdish people and still they are supporting them with the money and with uh, uh, weapons in this area not only Daesh, but supporting all those jihadist groups uh, especially in the equipped areas because they have collected them and they are still organizing them and supporting them with the, uh, the money and the weapons. Uh, the last point is I would want to mention is uh, the ideological side of it. Uh, we are PYD we, since we have established in the 2003, uh, we were depending on the ideology and the ideas, uh, thoughts of Mr. Ojalan Abdullah Ojalan, who is uh, a leader of the Kurdish people. Uh, he's uh, also, I mean, his ideas is uh, uh, considering the grassroots democracy, um, and we are following this, and also looking for the democratic nation instead of uh, nation state, uh, because he, he thinks, and we think uh, that the nation state is, is finished, and it was a cause for people to, to fight, especially in the Middle East, uh, to in, fight in between the nations. I mean, for one century, it caused millions of uh, uh, casualties and uh, caused many uh, massacres against the Armenians, the Syriacs, and the Kurdish people mostly. So we have to, to I mean, get rid of these uh, uh, nation states everywhere to live all together with a freedom, with a, a different culture, just to be like roses in one garden. And this is his idea, and we are following it. And the, the second point, uh, we are depending on the, um, I mean, the people, I mean, all the people organizing them. If you organize your people according to this ideology, which is uh, looking for the benefit of the people and everybody, uh, benefit from it as a blue threat democracy. I think they will gain a lot of things that we have done, as we have done, I mean, in, in, in Rojava, and we are still following it till now. And uh, the last point I want to mention, I would like to thank all those uh, uh, social democratic alliance, I mean, social alliance in socialist, uh, socialist alliance over all the world. They were, um, because uh, they were the main supporters of our idea and our project in the Rojava. And um, so thank you for all these comrades who supported our struggle and they were beside us till now. And uh, we think the final uh, victory will be for the uh, Kurdish people and their, the Kurdish people's friends uh, for Democrat uh, for the socialists, uh, socialist alliance all over the world in Europe and in Southeast Asia. 
and um, everywhere because it's the people organization and they, they can lead uh, all the people, all the nations uh, to the victory for, for their lands and even for Latin America and everywhere. And uh, this is the only um, we, if we organize and uh, support each other to be uh, together, I mean, in sol solidarity uh, against the capitalism and all, all over the world at that time will be more powerful and we will get uh, to our aims uh, as soon as we can. So uh, we we are we consider ourselves as a part of this uh, alliance. I mean, uh, for those uh, people's alliance against the people. I mean, as members of the uh, democratic uh, uh, democratic. Uh, I mean, uh, modernity uh, against this capitalism or capitalism modernity in the world, which they are supported by all the capitalist countries and the power. So we are uh, we are representing uh, a part of uh, uh, those people who are struggling against the capitalism. Uh, thank you very much again for giving me this opportunity to address you. And we hope also to be in contact with uh, all, uh, uh, I mean, members of uh, uh, this alliance uh, over all the world uh, to have a very stronger uh, alliance and uh, very stronger, I mean, people because our people need uh, such a solidarity between all the sides. And thank you again for very much. and. Uh, if you have any questions direct to me, I will be ready to answer. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, can you hear me? Yep. <laughs> Thank you so much, Saleh. Um, we will continue to support our Kurdish comrades in, in, in your struggle for justice. And yeah, thank you so much for your insights and for your leadership in this very important people's revolution. Um, so we will now have the opportunity to ask Saleh some questions. Um, thank you for sticking around, Saleh. I can see a couple of questions in the Q&A. So thank you, comrades, for those. Um, I will, I'll read them out in a second, but I would like to encourage anyone else um, here to ask uh, questions using the Q&A section. Um, I'll read the first one, first question out to you, Saleh. The first question is, is a military or armed revolution necessary for other nations to liberate themselves as you have? Yeah, should I answer? Yeah, you can, you can answer that one, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Well, uh, I believe, uh, I mean, any people anywhere they're living, they should, uh, they need uh, to protect themselves. Uh, this uh, protection could be through the, uh, rules and um, I mean even the um, through many many difficult uh, I mean different organizations and one of them is uh, is the defense units uh, should protect the people because the enemies they wouldn't hesitate if they are not able to to defeat such a movement uh, uh, by ideas and by law and so they will attack you so you should protect yourself. So it's necessary to protect that, protect it. And even I'm talking of not only uh, the people themselves and also the organizations. Uh, I mean, if we have idea and we would like to organize our people by some ideas, grassroots dem democracy, whatever it is, we need to have a protection units to protect ourselves. But it, it's the last point that we, people should have. I mean, before everything, they should have uh, you know, their mentality, their idea to change, to accept, to living together, to live in peace. And the enemies around, or the, let's say the uh, capitalism or capitalist powers, when attack you, you should be able to defend yourself. So, uh, so if you have power, it should be in the limit of the uh, a legitimacy of defending yourself, not to attack the others. So this is what I think uh, we should have. I mean, 
if we have some military organizations to protect the people and the lands. Thank you. Thanks, Saleh. Uh, the next question is from Walter Piso. Can you help us to understand better the Oshelan concept of democratic nation opposed to nation state? Well, uh, as I said, I mean, we, PYD, we were established in, uh, again, uh, according to the uh, ideas and um, philosophy of Mr. Ojala, uh, which uh, he was struggling himself since 1973. And he uh, looked through all the history of the Middle East and uh, the complex and uh, his first past, it was PKK, which was established in 1978 and since then uh, here um, here struggling everywhere and started the, uh, to defend the Kurdish people by the arms in 1984 15 on August and since now he's uh, in struggle I mean armed struggle against the Turkish states and nobody says but uh, I would like to say at least I mean maybe hundred thousand of uh, people they were killed and still well, this struggle um, continuing till now, and the war now mostly in South Kurdistan, which is in north of Iraq, and the Turkish people didn't hesitate to use the chemical weapons, which is the major uh, point now all the world is looking for, using the chemical weapons against the uh, guerrillas in the mountain and the Kurdish people. So they are still struggling, I mean. Well, the idea is of Mr. Ojanan, it was very important because he looked through the, uh, the history of the Middle East and um, since maybe the first uh, nation state was, I mean, as an idea was uh, uh, spread around in Europe after the, uh, the French Revolution. And then maybe about 300 billion people, they were killed just because everybody wanted to establish uh, the uh, nation states for themselves in Europe, which uh, was, I mean, the, the idea of nation state was born. And then when it transferred to, to Middle East, of course, uh, it, it, it caused a lot of, uh, I mean, uh, massacres among the people for the Turkish Empire. And so uh, they massacred and genocide the, the Armenians, one and a half million Armenians were killed just because the Turkish side wanted to establish their uh, nation state and the Syriacs, 700,000 Syriacs, they were killed and the Kurdish people, maybe thousands of hundreds of the Kurdish people, they were also slaughtered until now it didn't finish. So where, where is the solution? I mean, the solution is to, to have an idea for those people to live together, to establish a nation instead of the nation states to have a democratic uh, nation, a state or land or part. So this is the idea we are following. And this is the cause uh, to have a democratic uh, nation instead of, um, and uh, all the Middle East could be uh, a democratic nation, federalism between the people. I mean, the Kurdish people with the Arabs and so instead of fighting each other, and also the Turkish nation and the, the Persian, so instead of fish, I mean, fighting each other, they can live together. So this is the, the, the most important point in the Mr. Ojalan's idea. And I think uh, Middle East uh, people, they started everybody to believe, especially, I mean, as I mentioned, because we have this example in Northeast of Syria, uh, Kurdish people living with the Arabs, with the, Turkmen's with the Syriacs, uh, which were used uh, mainly by the, the capitalism and for used by those uh, nation states power to, to let them to fight each other. And now living together in, the, in peace, and they are able to, to protect themselves. So this is what's uh, main point. And uh, we believe, I mean, if you are able to do it in the Middle East, which is the source of all uh, complexes, I mean, and affecting all the world. So you should be very successful as I think 
and we have done it till now, but we are still trying to defend ourselves against those uh, the capitalist powers, especially the, the Turkish fascist states, which is attacking everywhere as you are following, I mean, and it's uh, becoming, a, uh, I mean, a threat for everybody, Eastern Europe, in the Middle East, in Libya, in Caucasia, and in Syria. So uh, still we are in struggle. And of course, we need our friends to support us, our comrades everywhere. Thank you. Thank you, Walter, for your question. Uh, Sally, the next question comes from Emmanuel, uh, sorry, uh, Carmela Emmanuel. Uh, she says, thank you so much, comrade. Uh, would you please outline more about the way your party organized prior to the revolution? And can you describe the way the thinking of the Kurdish revolutionaries developed from the 1970s up to the adoption of the ideas of autonomous democratic confederalism? Uh, well, uh, yes, uh, as I said, I mean, maybe since 1970s and even before that, because uh, our first party, the Kurdish party was established in Syria, uh, among the Kurdish people in Syria in 1957. But the ideas and the mentality was a socialist just like uh, I mean, the other organizations, but they were not able to do it. I mean, it's just like was a fashion for that. And uh, they were looking, I mean, uh, according to their idea, they were looking to establish a nation state. So the nation states is a kind of uh, uh, a weapon or uh, let's say the slogan you have, but it doesn't mean you will succeed because the other people, especially the uh, the people who they have controlled their area, uh, they know how to use this weapon against the other people for to massacre them, to finish them. So they were not, not able to do that. And we believed uh, democratic socialism, which we are following, it was only the way uh, could rescue those people. And maybe uh, the people established maybe in, since uh, 1957 and then after that in 1970. And so uh, they were able to impose a nation ideas or uh, as a Kurdish people, uh, Kurdish culture, but that they were not able to organize all these people and make them to defend themselves uh, against, uh, uh, against many ways which are used by the capitalism, like, uh, I mean, uh, like, uh, rules and uh, uh, like demographic changes and like uh, uh, also the, I mean, assimilation. And so they were not able to stand against this one. Uh, but those people, I mean, when we, we, we impose them with uh, these ideas of uh, ideological ideas of Mr. Rojaland and the democratic nations and whatever we are looking for, uh, they were not able to defend themselves, to organize themselves because, and the uh, grassroots democracy, because everybody felt that this is his duty and he should protect himself. And they were able to organize themselves according to that, not only the Kurdish people, but also the Arabs, because they were suffering from the dictatorship of, of Assad and the other nations before them, and uh, the others also, and also the the remains of uh, Syriacs, which they were massacred by Turkey, and the Armenians and the Chechens, which they are living together in our area. So, so we were together. We were able to um, to have everybody organized and working together by this grassroots democracy to to have their organizations to do it. So this is the way we can say. Uh, what I mean, I mean uh, the organizations or the parties, political parties established before that, and there are still, I mean, some parties in the, in uh, our system, but they don't have a, a very a wide uh, range people of supporters among them. They are still looking for the uh, the nation state to establish nation states and so. 
um, but they were not able to organize the people as we have organized and succeeded till now. Thank you. Thanks, Zoe. The next question asks, how important is educating the masses to minimize influence of, re of reactionary ideology like religious extremism? How did you manage to educate your people and what methods did you use? Well, uh, yeah, this is the most difficult things. Maybe uh, you can have some people just to enforce them to do what you like, and uh, maybe you can surrender them, and maybe you can kill them if you like. But leaving the people and changing the mentality is the, the most difficult things you can do. So you should be patient, and you should... Uh, be able to explain what you are looking for and uh, for his benefits. And that was what we are doing. I mean, even before that, Mr. Ojalan was uh, saying, and one of their friends were saying, well, we have to persuade the people and to, to change their mentality. And uh, if they need uh, three hours, we were talking to them three hours. If he needs uh, 300 hours, we were able to talk to him 300 hours. So this is the way we should do. Until now, since we have established as a, as a party in 2003, till now, we have a da daily meetings between the people, daily conferences in everywhere, telling them uh, what is the grassroots democracy, what is the brotherness between the nations and components, uh, what we should do, how we should protect ourselves, what the capitalism and those people occupying, I mean, our areas, how we can stand against them. So what I mean, you should be able to make uh, change the mentality. If you don't, so you cannot gain every, anything to, to do. So this is, uh, we should be, I mean, before everything, you should understand what you are doing, I mean, uh, ideologically and in the mentality. Your mentality is very, should be very clear about the ideas. And secondly, you should impose your ideas and your mentality to the people to, um, to change their mentality. You can believe now, I mean, still, I, we are dealing with a society here. Still, we can find some people, and their mentality did, goes back to 1,400 1, years ago, to the beginning of Islam, just to killing and slaughtering and so They still have this mentality. So if you cannot change this mentality, you cannot do anything among your people. And we can, I mean, tribal mentality, I mean, a very fascist nation mentality and uh, the, everything you can find in the, in the Middle East societies. And this is the way to do it. You have to persuade everybody. You have to talk to everybody. You should be patient to, uh, to, to make them to understand the grassroots democracy, living together instead of killing each other and the religious now, it should not be a reason to kill somebody as they have massacred the Yazidis. So um, this needs everything. I mean, needs uh, the change in the mentality before everything you should do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and great questions, by the way, from, from everybody. The, the next question um, is about the ecology as a feature of the Rojava revolution. Um, would you be able to speak more about this, Saleh, and also um, maybe, you know, talk about, you know, what is your attitude in dealing with global warming? Well, we think uh, the most important thing in all the societies in the, uh, to have their mentality for the, the women, uh, equality, I mean, equality with the women in the society, this uh, what we have done now and uh, uh, our all our organizations and uh, I mean our tools and um, the government or whatever you say we have 50 percent for I mean equality between the men and women the women is sharing in everything and uh, including the 
co-presidential systems and all parties now we have. We have co-presidential system and in all in the institutions in the uh, our system we have equality. And the nature of the woman when she is able to do it, she is a friend of the ecology. Of course, I mean, we, we can follow what's going on in the world, what have um, this capitalism done to the humanity now, everybody is suffering, even maybe he doesn't gain anything, he's just staying in his home and in his village, he's affected um, by this uh, uh, ecological changes because of the capitalism, because they never uh, had a mercy against uh, uh, the nature. They just wanted to gain their, uh, their benefit only. So they have destroyed the world. And of course, I mean, it's the main point for, for every, all the socialist organizations and the democratic organizations working for the humanity. The one part of their duty is looking for the ecological things. Of course, uh, I mean, if we say ecology, it's not only for Rojava, because I mean, the atmosphere is shared by everybody. But from our part, we should share in it. Uh, the, what's the pity now? We are still, I mean, have fighting. We are fighting, trying to, uh, to, uh, to save the people and the people, they were able to save their nature and their uh, ecology in our areas. And uh, all Kurdistan is, I think, uh, just uh, uh, by the mountains and the nature of uh, Kurdistan uh, could uh, do a lot of things for the humanity because of this uh, wide range uh, of their mountains and even their uh, their green uh, face of the world. So uh, they will be helpful, but it should be, for, first of all, uh, protected by, by the people. I mean, if the people are not free, um, they cannot do anything to their land. And even they cannot share in the protecting the ecology, I mean, to have the ecological life. And the ecology is the most point to which we are educating to our people and trying to do whatever we can. But uh, was pitied, I mean, till now our people are uh, are trying to even to save themselves. I mean, they are in the war, actually, uh, war against those fascists, and uh, um, I mean, war against the destructionary powers, uh, just like Daesh, and those jihadists, and uh, of course, I mean, uh, the ecology is... Uh, uh, one of uh, our most uh, of our goals, which we are looking for. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, I'm just gonna. All right. So the next question comes from. Uh... Ooh, sorry, I've just lost my place. Comes from Philip Wong. Roughly how many countries have publicly expressed their support for a Kurdish homeland and what statements have been made in the UN General Assembly? Well, uh, the main point as I would like to mention uh, uh, regarding this question is uh, if we are talking about the United Nations, uh, actually, it's not the United Nations because it doesn't include uh, the nations without states. So it should be United States, not United Nations. And of course, they have put many rules and regulars just to protect the nation states. Uh, can you imagine? I mean, we have in the United Nations, we have uh, 193 members. All of them are nation states. Uh, regardless of their dictatorship or their killing or massacring the people they never kill. But uh, if you want to be live in this world, in this globe, you should be a member of United Nations and they should, uh, I mean, recognize you. I, as a pit, I mean, if you have uh, uh, people struggling against uh, uh, fascism, just like a Turkish state and like, uh, the Arabic uh, fascism and the Arabic mentality and Islamic mentality 
and the other nation, I mean, from uh, the Persian state, um, which is the Islamic uh, nation. So you cannot get anything. You have to fight all struggle to have your struggle against those to be recognized by the, the, by the United Nations. And we are, at this moment, we are, of course, we wish to, but they are not looking. I mean, even the considering because it's against uh, their interests and uh, each of them, they have lobbies and they have friends in the United Nations. And so, so they are obstacling everything and even our movements. The most uh, diplomacy we have followed to have uh, uh, to have friends and relations with the uh, organization, I mean, over all the Europe, uh, to have a popular power, and we were able to do it. And now, in even maybe even in in your countries and uh, everywhere, if you are uh, standing in solidarity with the Kobani Day, which was first of uh, uh, November, October, so it means uh, we have. Uh, I mean, succeeded to have our friends everywhere. So we are depending on the people and the people, I mean, the organization replay, replacing, the representing the people everywhere in the world, in Europe, in Asia, in South America, in Latin America, in North America, everywhere. We are depending in our diplomacy to have relations with this, of course, uh, including the uh, Socialist Alliance, uh, we believe, uh, all of those that are looking for grassroots democracy and we have our uh, common goals so we can do, we can change. Otherwise, if we don't have such a friends, we cannot uh, do anything. Um, I mean, of course, we wish to have uh, our representative in the United Nations or the everywhere and uh, to talk by the name of the Kurdish people. But sorry, we don't have anything till now. Uh, because of those the fascist mentality of the Turks and the Arabs and the Persians uh, and uh, uh, the, I mean, uh, French states, which they are supporting them. I mean, maybe the Turkish states, it's a NATO member, they wouldn't allow. I mean, maybe everybody of you, you have heard about this uh, conspiracy against Mr. Ocalan because he was a leader of the Kurdish niche, nation and it was... Uh, uh, designed by NATO and NATO members, and uh, so in 1999, and he is still in prison. I mean, looking for the support of uh, our people. So this is the case. Uh, I mean, uh, all the uh, fascist nations around us, uh, they don't allow, they don't give the opportunity to express ourselves to the others. So this is the situation we are, we are in. Yes, um, thanks, Saleh. We've got three questions in the uh, coming up, and I'll, I also have a question that I'd like to fit in later. The next question comes from Alex Bainbridge, and he says, um, he said that this is not his view, but how would you respond to people who suggest the Assad regime is an anti-imperialist force? and should be supported against the United States? Because some of the same people you know, suggest that the Rojava revolutionaries have made a pact with the devil, um, which is, that is uh, US imperialism. So how do you respond to that? Uh, well, uh, the first question for the Assad regime, I mean, uh, because he was a fascist Arab nation, I mean, uh, from the beginning, not now, but he was, of course, I mean, looking for the support of the uh, socialist blocs, I mean, which was uh, Russia and the others, and he still have uh, a kind of uh, uh, relations with the Russia, and the most supporting this regime, but Russia is, I think, uh, now, it's a capitalist more to be a socialist and looking for the people because uh, uh, the Russians are completely different and uh, they are part of this capitalism now. And also so those religions, uh, the state of Iran, which they are supporting. But they are showing, I mean, just um, showing uh, from outside that they are 
we have relation with the socialists and so, and actually not. So if you want to know the reality, you should be Kurdish living in Rojava or in Syria to, so, to see the reality. I mean, we, uh, uh, we were seeing in what happened in 1962 when he just uh, ignored the Syrian uh, identity for the Kurdish people. They said they are not citizens. And then in 1974 for demographic changes, he just brought the Arabs inside. And uh, till now, I mean, he's supported by these fascists and the Islamic fascists in Iran, they are supporting them to destroy the people. So I think uh, it's a wrong, wrong uh, uh, image for the Syrian uh, government and the Syrian regime. And uh, now if we are suffering from this, uh, what they were doing against the people, I mean, despotic regime, killing the people and uh, Maybe everybody knows uh, he's just um, keeping the to be on the power against um, maybe 500,000 people, Syrians, they were killed. And still he doesn't made any change in its mentality. Uh, even for these uh, parts, he was able uh, to be given by the Russians, liberated areas. He still the mentality is the same doing the same he was doing before 2011 without any change in the mentality so this is the actual regime for our um, the support with the international uh, coalition what can i say i mean in kobani it started to to have the relations with international coalition just against the the uh, those the enemy of the humanity against uh, isis against daesh slaughter the people and do so we need anybody to support to be so that solidarity with us there was nobody trying to help us trying to uh, coordinate with us against them i mean because they were supported i mean maybe uh, by Turkish state, yes, but the Arabs, they were keeping silent because they don't like, I mean, the Kurdish people. They don't want uh, those Kurdish people to be uh, rescued from Daesh. So the only power who supported said, be said uh, be, beside us, uh, it was this international uh, coalition against Daesh. And so since then, we have relations with them. Until now, our relations is just to defeat Daesh against these sleep, sleeping cells and so And we were in the situation just like, I mean, somebody has put the knife on your neck. You have to do something to rescue yourself. And they came to help us. They came to fight against Daesh with us. And still this coordination is continuing till now. Uh, it doesn't mean we are slaves to the, some countries or any idea. Uh, we still believe uh, in our, I mean, uh, slogans and our ideas and this. Uh, so uh, we are not taking orders from anybody and everybody. I mean, some, some of those powers who doesn't know the reality, trying to show us uh, as uh, uh, coordinating or whatever I mean for the imperialism and so push truth is not like that at all. We are free in our ideas, free of our movements. And uh, of course, I mean, uh, we wouldn't um, give up uh, about our slogans and our uh, principles of this uh, grassroots democracy, organizing our people, defending ourselves. So uh, it's kind of coordination between the two sides against the humanitarian, I mean, enemy, uh, the enemy of the humanity, which is Daesh and those jihadists. And it's a threat for everybody because as you know, in Europe and the, all the countries and the most uh, people whose enemy for is this uh, socialist ideas. He slaughters everybody. They don't care about uh, whatever uh, his nation or his idea just against them is slaughtering. And what we are doing, I mean, to have friends and some, uh, I mean, people to fight uh, against this uh, brutal organizations together, 
And which is the international coalition doing so till now? Thank you. Thanks, Saleh. And um, ap apologies, I uh, didn't see that someone had their hand raised in the chat. Uh, I'd like to invite Nesta ones to uh, use their mic if they'd like to ask a question. Uh, and please, um, all participants, keep your comments or questions to one minute. Thank you. Uh, so you want me to close it? Uh, no, sorry, I'm just trying to, uh, one second, I'm just, someone wants to use their mic and ask you a question using their mic, but I'm just struggling to unmute them. Could I just have someone from, uh, can I just have someone do that for me? For some reason, it's not working. Okay, maybe maybe we'll come back to Nesta ones. Apologies, I'll come back to you, Nesta ones, um, because we need you to unmute in order to speak. And uh, there might be some problems with unmuting your mic. So I'm going to go to another question that was written in the chat box. That's why I missed it. Um, they were unable to ask their question in the Q and A. This question comes from Sam Wainwright Saleh, and he said. Uh, Erdogan is attacking the Kurdish people on all three fronts. Could you discuss the interrelationship between the various fronts, the occupation of parts of Rojava, the banning of the FDP in Turkey, and the invasion of northern Iraq? Could you discuss the interrelationship between the struggles in these three areas? Has the occupation of parts of Rojava changed the center of gravity of, of Kurdish struggle? How are people surviving in the occupied areas of Rojava? Well, uh, of course, I mean, uh, uh, everybody knows uh, um, the relations between all these jihadist groups, especially Daesh and uh, uh, and the Turkish state, I mean, because uh, maybe they were supporting at the beginning secretly, and then uh, after the defeat uh, of Daesh in 2015 in Kobani, uh, everybody was cleared, and they saw how many, uh, how much uh, uh, the Turkish uh, regime fascists are supporting Daesh. So we believe, I mean, uh, we should ma shouldn't make any difference between Daesh and the, the Turkish fascist regimes, which they are enemy for everybody because uh, of their ideas. Uh, they th still think uh, they are able uh, to expand uh, their land to the Ottoman Empire as it was uh, before. I mean, in uh, beginning of the 20th century, they are still, in, uh, still trying to do it. So this is the way I was dealing, I mean, and this is uh, the only the extremist Islam organizations that could be helpful, they can uh, get the gains which they are looking for, and this is the way he's supporting all those uh, Islamic uh, organizations, jihadist groups, uh, including Daesh, till now, because they have uh, uh, they have their camps inside Turkey and they are supported by the money, weapon, and even uh, in our areas when we are capturing some uh, sleeper, uh, sleeping cells, I mean, in our areas, they are uh, related to Turkey and uh, they have relations with them and getting the weapon with them. So what I mean, I mean by doing this is not only the enemy of the Kurdish people, is the enemy of all the humanity because there is no groups, I mean, uh, some explo exploded anything in Europe without connection with the Turkey. They go through the Turkey, they were supported by Turkey, intelligence services and whatever it is. So he is, is a threat for everybody, not only for us. And in these areas, occupied areas, you just, uh, uh, organized all these remains of Daesh, which was defeated in our areas, and the other organization, Jabhat Nusra, which is keeping in Idlib and his area, I mean, uh, in the western of Syria. 
So he's organizing them, he's using these areas as a base for them to train them, to send them to everybody, everywhere he likes, uh, looks is necessary uh, for him. He sent them to mercy, just like mercenaries. And there are mainly remains of those organizations. He sent them to Libya, still fighting them, and they will send maybe uh, some of them to Europe to have, uh, I mean, all this, uh, uh, members captured in Germany and other places, they came from Turkey, they went from Turkey, maybe in order to do something over there. So he's still, I mean, a threat for everybody, for all the humanity, just like what Daesh was, uh, uh, how Daesh was a threat for all the world, all the humanity is the similar Turkish fascist states is a dangerous, I think uh, everybody should do it. I mean, do something against this fascist um, at least, I mean, to to make uh, this danger, I mean, just to uh, get away from rid of those people, I mean, but it's uh, many capitalist uh, countries and the European Union and the others because they have their interest with uh, Turkey, so they are doing the same. And I think as uh, the questioner made uh, we should have a solidarity between all the people dealing directly with the Turkish uh, uh, fascist states, just like uh, HDP inside, which they are Kurdish party mainly, and also this PKK guerrillas, which they are fighting against them, uh, against the chemical weapons used by the Turkish uh, fascism in, uh, I mean, uh, in uh, the, in, South Kurdistan, north of Iraq, and everybody should be, be united and be in the solidarity against this, this fascism. Now, not only the Kurdish people, but all the nations affected by this policy followed by the um, Turkish fascist state. This is what we think it should be. Thank you. Thanks, Saleh. And sorry to that participant. We, um, we've, if they're there and they can hear me, we've unmuted your mic, but um, I think, yeah, I think uh, they're having some problems speaking into the mic or something. Um, so sorry about that. We've got two more questions um, for you, Saleh. The first one comes from uh, Walter Piso. What can you tell us about the investigation of the use of chemical weapons in Sarakanya, it's also known as uh, Ras Alin, uh, by the Turkish army. Yes, uh, well, uh, the chemical weapons is the weapon of Turkey, which uh, especially uh, used against the Kurdish people. And uh, they had a lot of documents uh, showing that uh, maybe from uh, many decades, uh, those weapons are against, are used against the Kurdish people. Maybe they have used it in Dersim in 1937 uh, uh, and uh, 1938. And then uh, it was used against the guerrillas in, in, in Kurdistan, North Kurdistan, in 1993. And then all documented, but nobody want to care because maybe this weapons also coming from NATO. And they used uh, these chemical weapons against the, 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 I mean, the Kurdish people inside Turkey, against the guerrillas. And recently they are using it uh, very widely and very, uh, in. Um, I mean, very, very hard way against the Kurdish people in the mountains. I mean, the Kurdish uh, guerrillas, which fighting the mountains. And according to the announcements by the, uh, I mean, the forces, defense forces of the uh, Kurdish people, the defense units, I mean, uh, there are in the recent, I mean, this uh, uh, few months, talking about three or four months, about 38 people, they were killed by the guerrillas by these weapons. And a few days ago, one of those commanders of uh, the protecting units, I mean, Murat Kareilan, 
He mentioned the five kind of these chemical weapons used by the Turkey regime against them. So it means uh, everybody is kill, keeping silent because Turkey is uh, a member of NATO. And maybe uh, even if we remember, I mean, there were some American attacks against the Syrian regime because uh, there were claims that the Syrian regime had uh, used the chemical weapons in Al Homs. But nobody is saying anything to Turkey, which is very clear. And even the people, the organizations, the Kurdish people asking for, uh, I mean, a delegation to go, to go and investigate the situation on the ground. But nobody is taking care because uh, I don't know why the reason, but maybe the, all these organizations are, are afraid of I mean, Erdogan or the uh, Turkish state or NATO is protecting them because, as we know, I mean, all these uh, uh, modern uh, weapons against the Kurdish people, just like drones used in our areas and the chemical used in the, uh, I mean, in the mountains of Kurdistan, uh, they are property of the NATO. So they don't care, they don't want to investigate, and they see it's, uh, everything is allowed for Turkey to do, you know, just to kill the people. So I think it's a strange situation. Uh, but as you know, I mean, there, there were a lot, a lot of Kurdish people and their friends and their, their allies, just like you, you, I mean, they should raise their voice against those chemical weapons. I mean, it's prohibited everywhere. But against the Kurds, it's allowed. So it's it's very strange situation, really. And at least to have some investigations about that, to send somebody, some people, some committees, I mean, to make the investigation on the, the mountains. Because as we know, I mean, uh, those uh, chemical using of the chemical people, uh, could uh, chemical weapons could be recognized even if... Uh, after many, many years also, how it was used in these caves and uh, these areas. So uh, the investigation will show it. So, and even, I mean, for, from everywhere, our people have been in our, all the world and as an uh, organization in the solid solidarity with the Kurdish struggle, they can sign, uh, yeah, they can send this kind of uh, delegation just to investigate what's going on over there. So this is the way we think and we hope uh, from our alliance to to do something, to stay with uh, this Congress, Kurdish uh, people in Europe for their demonstrations, for their uh, activity against these chemical weapons. It will be very, very appreciated, actually. Thank you. Thanks, Saleh. And just to let participants know, we will be wrapping up in about 14 minutes. Uh, and I've got three questions left. I might combine two of them um, together. So the next question, Saleh, uh, comes from uh, Tayuki. When the troubles and unrest increased in Syria, uh, finding that the entwined forces were fighting for power and not for democracy, and you know you were you were telling us about um, the importance of organizing your people, um, and you, you know establishing alongside the youth and the self defense units in the villages. Uh, and uh, Dayuki asks in Thailand uh, that they are fighting on the streets, but how um, you know they're asking how can you organize a little bit um, better, a bit stronger. Well. Uh... Depending on our experience, really, I mean, uh, you have to persuade the people to organize themselves. I mean, uh, we are if we are if we are saying the grassroots democracy uh, should start from the people organizing themselves. I mean, they should be persuaded that uh, the people organize; they can do everything. If they are not, um, I mean. Uh, organized, uh, everybody will do something against them and they, they are without defense. The only thing can uh, protect the people and uh, uh, protect the nations and protect the society and this society to be organized to do it. I mean, not I'm not talking only about the 
defending units or defend the society, also for everything. I mean, uh, for cultural, for any activity, if you are not organized, you cannot do anything. And the defending the people is the one of this side. And the, just because of this reason, especially I mean the people who are able to defend the society and even by the weapon and so uh, are youth, youth people, I mean, uh, those, uh, I mean, youth people in the society, uh, they are able to do it. And we are, should start from them. And this is the why, I mean, the enemies of the people and the enemies of the societies, they start from the, their, those youth, youth people. Uh, just to give them in some ways by uh, maybe by drugs and some other ways and just to make them not able to organize themselves. And uh, I think we should be very careful about that uh, for our young people, for our youth people, because they are the power of the uh, society and we should protect them uh, by supporting them and organizing them to make them able to protect themselves and and then protect the society. So if the youth people and the young people are not protecting, protecting their net, if they are not able to protect themselves, they cannot protect the society also. We should be careful about that. I mean, it starts from the, the youth people, I mean, young people, and also uh, with the women are very, very effective in the society. And they should be aware, should be persuaded to organize themselves, uh, first of all. Uh, and this is the why I, I think it's a duty for everybody to protect this youth, the, the youth people, uh, youth, uh, young people, I mean, because they are the future of the, the society. And everywhere, not only in Thailand, but also in Syria and uh, the Kurdish community and everywhere. Uh, those uh, people should be protected and directed to the right thing, uh, which is uh, the humanitarian values, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the next question was, um, what was the biggest obstacle you have faced or are currently facing in the Rojava situation? And uh, what were the actions that were taken to solve or take care of the obstacle? Um, and how did you gather support despite, um, you know, whatever obstacle you, you had to face? Well, the most uh, obstacle we have, I mean, is the obstacle for the changing of the mentality. And this is most difficult thing, as, as I mentioned from the beginning also. Uh, because in the Middle East, we have uh, those ideas and those mentalities coming uh, all, all together. I mean, I'm talking about all the religious and the tribal and whatever in the society. You can find you know, these ideas and so on. And uh, of course, I mean, you cannot do anything in the society if you are not able to change their mentality. So this mentality changing is the most difficult things we are facing. It's need to be patient and you have to, in your struggle and to start with, to make him, I mean, uh, those people, I mean, coming from 1,400 years ago till now, they didn't change their mentality. It's the most difficult to do. And as I mentioned in the beginning, maybe you can kill somebody, you can keep, uh, and then, I mean, abducted or in the prison or whatever you can do, you are able to do it. But changing the mentality is the most difficult things you can do. And this is what we are doing. And this need, uh, I mean, any organization or any people or any person, he want to change uh, the mentality of the others. He should be very, very patient and he should be very uh, aware of what going, I mean, even by the knowledge of the history and the, I mean, uh, of sociology and the people that should know the everything about the society is struggling and to change the mentality. And that's what we are doing and still we are doing, I mean, because if we have maybe 
those uh, sleeping cells of Daesh also is there, but it means they are not persuaded to, to mentality that they are doing something wrong uh, to harm the, the society. So, uh, and maybe they are doing for their money, I mean, just to get the money, to become mercenaries for the others. But the most difficult is to fight somebody ideologically by the uh, thoughts, by the ideas, I mean, uh, and telling them the principles of the humanity. So this is the most difficult we are facing now, and we are struggling, I am struggling against that. Of course, I mean, we have some other obstacles, I mean, economical, because we are under the ban from all, all the sides. I mean, we are surrounded by the Syrian regime from the one side, and also from the Turkish from the other side, and the Iraqis, and everybody is trying to, to make us in the prison. I mean, this is the other difficulties we are facing. And let me say, I mean, if we are uh, saying this uh, northeast of Syria, we are talking about more than five million people living there. And just because it's not recognized by everybody, we are depending uh, for our daily living, our, our economy, we are depending on the smugglers. Uh, even if we need some medicines to get from outside, nobody will allow to come in because we are not recognized and we have to do it through the smugglers. So we are just trying to keep all these five million living day by smuggling. So <laughs> it's, it's another difficult way to do it. I mean, of course, there are a lot of details of that. And now, as you know, I mean, even the gates for border gates from Iraq, so it was closed by the United Nations, uh, I mean, decision. It's not open till now yet. And even um, this, uh, I mean, the international health organizations, if, if they want to help us by giving some, uh, maybe, maybe even the vaccines for this uh, uh, pandemic, so they, are, they don't have a way to bring it in because the, the only gate allowed to, is not in our area, it's through the Turkish nation to Italy. So there is no way. So we have to get it, even those medicines and those vaccines by smuggling them, I mean, somewhere. So this is difficulties we are facing, really. Thank you. Thanks, Saleh. We are coming to the end of the session, but I do have a couple more questions left um, and just one from me that I'm going to cheekily throw into the end. Um, the first question is how, um, you know, how have you gotten respect between the different ethnicities and religions? And um, I also wanted to lastly ask you, do, you, do the people of Rajava consider what they are constructing to be a socialist society. Um, I know you touched on this before, but you know when people ask, how do we go about building a social society as an alternative to capitalism? Could we refer to Rojava as an example? And you know, did the people uh, feel that way? Uh, well, uh, uh, first of all, I mean, you should get uh, rid of this. All this. Uh, a fascist mentality or those despotical mentality was depressed the people and so which we were suffering i mean a long uh, a long time i mean for centuries living in in the middle east so um, only the way is to make the people free to express themselves uh, for their culture for their language and so and of course because we as a Kurdish people, we were suffering from that. I mean, we don't want to implement this some ways to the other people. We would like to, to do, uh, I mean, for all the people to be free, to express themselves and uh, to be tied to their culture. Uh, and it's the ordinary way. And uh, if we are saying the uh, grassroots democracy, not only for one nation, for all those nations, the components living in there, and I think, we feel, I mean, for their emotion and for what looking for, I mean, because we were suffering. And this is the way we, 
to get the people, all, all those people together, I mean, I mean, all those depressed people, the Kurdish people, the Arabs who are living under the regime of the Basi system, I mean, depressing them for uh, many decades, and also the Armenians and the Syriacs, which they are remains of the uh, slaughtered by Turkey, I mean, in the genocides in 19. Uh, 15 and 19, uh, I mean, the beginning of the 20th century. So now we are living all together and we are happy about this model. Yeah, this is one point. And uh, the other, I mean, it's very difficult to make this change in, uh, in the Middle East, which is the source of all these conflicts. I mean, you can't find all the ideas. And so but it's very difficult to Persuade the, uh, per, I mean, uh, uh, to persuade the people that the uh, grassroots democracy and, uh, uh, I mean, explaining themselves, expressing themselves, to have a freedom for everybody, it's it's very difficult to do. But we succeeded to do it, and because of that, as you have mentioned, also, uh, our model, uh, what we have established here, is is a model for Middle East all not only for Syria. And of course, um, from our side, we have prepared, I mean, the uh, a roadmap, I mean, how to solve the Syrian uh, conflict by democracy, by Syrian people themselves. And we have even, I mean, an institution, we were able to put the institution for all of Syria. And this institution, I mean, the constitution uh, constitution, we have made a constitution project, I think uh, it's a, it's a valid and it could be implemented for all the nations uh, in the Middle East, I think it could be an example for leaving all the com com components together, freedom and so uh, Of course, uh, uh, we are saying democratic constitution, which is uh, related to the people's wish, I think. Yes, as you mentioned, uh, our model is a model not only for Syria, but also uh, for the Middle East, which is the most complicated uh, the societies living together and uh, uh, all these people, these ideas, uh, which is coming from the uh, tens of uh, centuries in this area. So this is the grassroots democracy and the uh, democratic nation as, as a goal is uh, will be able to solve all the problems in this area we think thank you thank you sally for answering all our questions um we are unfortunately out of time um but yeah clearly rojava represents a, a real threat to uh, western imperialism and, and all the reactionary regimes in the region in the region and it really shows how things can be different and yeah you're right the only way to fight against fascism and this brutal dictatorship is to have that solidarity and connection between pro um pro democracy parties and, and parties like us um this should be global um so you know and and while rojava was the focus the, the kurds are a people who have been split by imperialism you know between four countries and they are denied justice and freedom in, in all of them and they desperately need our support and solidarity um, from all progressive people everywhere so let's continue to support our comrades in their struggle and justice um, uh, thank you to all our participants for coming along and to all the organizers and, and translators and technical support and um, please stay tuned for the next session of the socialism conference the climate crisis why green capitalism cannot save us. Thank you in solidarity with the Rojava Re revolution. Thank you. Well, thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk to the people uh, and salute everybody and uh, have a uh, hope to see you again to express ourselves. Thank you very much for all comrades. Thank you.